Intangible assets are hugely important in practice. In the paper F3 exam, they don't tend to come up very much. When they do, it is in the context, pretty much always, um, of development costs. Let's take a look, first of all, though, at what an intangible asset is. An intangible asset is a non-current asset with no physical substance. So, for example, the physical substance may exist, but be trivial. So, for example, a contract um, for a footballer is an example of an intangible asset. Okay, if you have, say, for example, your football club and you pay a large amount of money to secure the services of a well-known high-profile footballer, you're not actually buying the footballer because that's kind of against the law to own the physical being of that person. What you're actually doing is buying the right for them to work for you and for nobody else. So therefore, what you're actually buying in that scenario is the contract of that person's um, service rather than the person themselves, fairly obviously. Um, they're often that's, that's typical of what these things are. They're typically looking at intellectual property or intellectual property rights. Now, the idea of intellectual property is basically knowledge. Now, knowledge itself is not an asset because you don't control it. Really, intangible assets are where you've got intellectual property rights. That means you've got the ability to use some knowledge to the implied exclusion of other people. That's what's going to give you the inflow of benefit. Um, let's take a look at some quick examples here. We take some examples of intangible assets you might expect to find in the financial statements of a pharmaceuticals company. Well, the one, one of them, fairly obviously, is patents, which they may have developed themselves. A patent is a right to um, use something to the exclusion of somebody else, or they may have bought it from somebody else. Another one is development costs. We'll look at those later on. Um, it's quite likely that they're going to have leases. Um, leases are going to change soon, so that all leases are intangible assets. But it at least can be, um, at the moment, tangible asset or an intangible, um, often classified as tangible, actually. But at least to use something could arguably be an intangible asset. Things like a license to operate is another example, um, because of the fact that if you've got a license to operate, let's say, in a particular location, then that gives you a right to do something. The actual drilling material you might put there or something is a is property planted equipment. But the license to do something in a particular place is an intangible right. Um, it's a contract that allows you to do something. All of these things, that's what they are. Okay, uh, finally, you might see things like goodwill. Goodwill is a very important issue in paper F7 and paper P2. But if you've purchased a business and you've purchased things like a client list in the process of that, that's called goodwill. Um, it's something that you couldn't actually sell without selling the business as a whole. I mean, the other things, they go on forever, but you might also have purchased things like trademarks too. So there are loads of examples. They are very common, and they're more common than, than not in businesses that are kind of knowledge-based, if you like. Now, the most common one that's going to come up in the exam is uh, research and development costs. This is two separate things, really. The accounting for research is always going to be an expense. Development costs may sometimes be an asset. The key issue is to know what the definition of an asset is. Well, you've got the definition to start off with here. It's a resource controlled by an entity which is expected to give an inflow of benefit. Now, the cutoff is that research here is knowledge kind of for knowledge's sake, and it's not particularly certain to give an inflow of benefit, so therefore it has to be treated as an expense. Development costs are something that are an intellectual property right. Um, it's something that's going to give you knowledge and ability to do something that other people can't do, and that may give you an inflow of benefits. But again, only if it's going to give you actually a commercially viable level of sales that's actually profitable. Now, research costs are early on in the stage of a development project. Most companies talk about R&D as if it was one item. Logically, they really aren't. Research costs are something before something has become commercially viable. And that's basically, as defined here in IS38, planned investigation with the prospect of gaining new scientific technical knowledge and understanding. Okay, technical knowledge and understanding is great, but it doesn't necessarily bring a benefit. So if you imagine, for example, being an R and a scientist and you discover a cure for cancer, okay, well, <laughs> you've got a conflict of interest ethically here because what you might want to do is share that knowledge. Um, the moment you speak to a lawyer, they would almost certainly advise you to keep your mouth shut and patent the thing so that you have an intellectual property right. That is then what would give you an inflow of benefit because people would have to pay you for the um, pay, pay you for the privilege of using it. Okay, so let's take a look at the criteria for whether or not development costs can be categorised as being an intangible asset. Remember the default thing, the default rule really in IFRS accounting is that any debits are expenses they have to be written off against profit or loss. Now, research costs, research costs are basically, give or take, the good kind of cut-off point here is everything up until the point of building your first working prototype if it's a physical good.
Okay. After that, you've got a working prototype. You've got something that looks like it's going to generate a series of uh, cash inflows in the future. You're going to treat that basically as an asset if it meets all of these. Now, this mnemonic is actually given in IS38 if people particularly like it. Uh, these, these criteria are given in IS38 paragraph 58. I do encourage you, actually, to look at the original documents wherever you have access to them. Um, but these are basically some rules that give us uh, some guidance on the principle that something is an asset if it's going to give an inflow of benefit. The first thing is you have to have resources to be able to complete the project. If you have knowledge but you've got no means of turning that into a cash inflow, it, it's not an asset. You've got to be able to do it, to complete it. It's got to be technically feasible because if it's not, then it's not going to generate an inflow of benefit. <coughs> Excuse me. It's got to be a probable it's going to give an inflow of benefit. In addition to being able to, um, to take the thing to a completion, you may you've got to intend to as well. Now let's say, for example, you are a pharmaceuticals company and you discover a new breakthrough that's going to cure a disease. Um, unfortunately, it's not necessarily certain to work and it might displace sales of other products. Well, in that situation, even if it is all of the other criteria, if you don't intend completing it, but you have a patent so nobody else can, it's never going to generate an inflow of benefit. Now, that raises ethical issues in that scenario, but the fact is that basically you have to be able to show that you are going to turn this thing into a generate, to generate a cash inflow in the future, or a series of cash inflows. So in addition to those criteria, also we need to make sure the expenditure can be separately recorded. That's really just to prevent companies from taking a whole load of general expenses and sort of writing them off, um, sorry, adding them to the, pre the value of a project that could, would qualify as a development project. Because remember, you prefer really debits to be in the balance sheet, the same to financial position as an asset, rather than statement of comprehensive income as an expense. Okay, so the conditions are relatively tight here. The write-off period, well, it's the general benefit, as we, the general kind of pattern we've seen with IS-16. You write things off over the period where they generate benefits. So the overriding aim here is to match the costs of the development project with the revenue stream that it generates. Now, in tangible assets, that can become typically rather more complicated than tangible, because very often you find that things generate the greatest revenues in the early years of commercial life. So you might use diminishing balance uh, amortization. Amortization, by the way, is just depreciation, but for intangible asset. It's the same thing. For some strange reason, historically, we've talked about depreciating tangible assets and amortizing intangible assets. Now, you don't actually even need to do that. A lot of companies are going to actually use an indefinite life model and test it every year for impairment. I think that probably goes beyond paper F3, but basically you're going to take this asset and write it off over the period that, generates, um, that, that it generates a, a return. So let's take a look at the uh, review self-test 2. What would we call each of these? I'm going to give you a few minutes. Uh, you pause the recording, have a go, and come back and decide what you think it is. Well, assuming you've done that, okay, the cost of finding out the cause of a type of cancer, that's research. Because of the fact that it's scientific knowledge, it might be very valuable, but it's not necessarily going to generate an income stream. In fact, most research goes absolutely nowhere. Most uh, noble endeavours in scientific survey here, like this one, actually go nowhere at all. The cost of clinical trials of a new drug, well, that's going to be after your working prototype stage, so that's development cost potentially, but of course, you're then looking at those IS38 paragraph 58, rat pi, um, as we use it as a mnemonic, that test basically to see if you're reasonably certain it will generate an income stream. The cost of a mailing list for potential clients, this is an intangible asset, I would say, as a general, basically, expense, research cost or development. Frankly, I would kind of say neither of those, really. This is a mailing cost for potential clients. If you have a right to use that, that's a general intangible asset, but it's not development costs. Most companies are going to say that will be a short-life asset, and therefore they just write it off as profit or loss anyway. Okay, a right to operate a radio station is also an intangible asset with a life here of five years because but for that license you wouldn't be able to actually operate the station. Cost of training staff, we've seen this before. Staff training is always an expense. And finally, the cost of prototype is development costs because the accounting standard says so. Okay, training costs, market research costs, all of that kind of stuff, advertising, always write it off as an expense. If in doubt, it's probably an expense.